Hello everyone, back tuning in to Gazza Viz on your Bank Holiday Monday. So as is tradition at Gazza Viz on the Bank Holiday, we're going to have a historic weather video. And today's historic weather video is going to be looking at the disasters that occurred through the period of 1952 and into 1953. So amongst the disasters, we've got the Lynmouth tragedy, uh, we've got the Great Smog of December 1952, and we've also got the severe floods of January and February uh, 1953. This is a really a defining period of weather and uh, it, caused, um, it caused a huge amount of legislation to be brought in after this period of uh, weather. Huge changes uh, were brought in to uh, flood defences, to uh, air quality. So it's a very important period of historical uh, weather and of his historical importance, uh, really, in terms of the development of the country this period from 1952 into 1953. I'm going to talk you through all of these disasters one by one uh, in a second. We've also got a very cold autumn to uh, look at as well. So we're going to be here for some time. There's a lot of information that's going to be contained within this video. Um, so you can't watch it all in one go. Don't worry, it will be placed within the historic archive of the weather videos at Gals Weather Vids um, and you'll be able to come back and watch a video whenever you want. A comfy chair and uh, a cup of tea going to be a requirement, I think, for um, this one. Before I get on with the uh, video, just uh, just to uh, say, to thank um, two uh, websites but i couldn't do these historic web videos without so we've got the historic archive of charts from uh wettercentral.d the historic archive there used to go back to january 1871 it now goes back to january 1851 so um you can wallow away many a happy hour uh, at the uh historic archive of charts at westcentral.d uh, there's also trevor harley's personal weather website where you hear lots of the information that's contained within this video most of it will come from uh, trevor harley's personal uh, weather website and as i couldn't do these weather videos without those two crucial elements i'm the smallest part of all of this really uh, i'm just the narrator that's telling the story but to bring it alive we have to have the charts with the information and as i say that uh, comes from uh, trevor harley and westcentral.d and a big big thank you to both of those websites for allowing us to use their information and their data. And you can find a link to both those websites on the uh, links page. So we've already, in a way, um, done 1952 as uh, one of our earliest videos, actually. And this is going to be kind of like the counterpart to that because um, our third ever historic weather video, right way back at the beginning of um, 2012, looked at a snowstorm that occurred uh, in uh, March, at the end of March, uh, 1952. So this one's going to be much more extensive, of course, uh, than that one. But in some ways, it's kind of like the uh, counterpart of that video. And uh, if you want to have a look at that, you, all you have to do is click the button at the top of the page that says Historic uh, Weather, and you'll go to our Historic Archive. Scroll down the list of uh, videos that we've done. We've done a lot of them uh, now. But uh, go right way down to the bottom. And third from the bottom, you will find the link that takes you to the page that contains the uh, video for the historic uh, weather of uh, March 1952, and as I say this is kind of like the counterpart that goes with that. But I look, uh, I look a lot younger uh, then on that video from uh, 2012, and I don't think I was as good a presenter uh, then either, to be honest. So um, you have to have a look and see uh, what you think. I know a lot of you do like to go back, have a look at those earlier videos uh, when, uh, from when we we're starting. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, so it's still there. If you want, ever want to have a look at that, that's how how uh, you do it. Right, we better get on with uh, today's uh, historic weather video. Just say again, big thanks for tuning in on this uh, Bank Holiday Monday. So we're going to begin in uh, the summer of 1952, actually starting on the 1st of July uh, 1952, when there's absolutely no sign at all of the devastating weather that's to come. Uh, what we actually have here on the 1st of July is a ridge of high pressure building in from off the Atlantic, bringing loads of dry 
and uh, fine and hot weather. Actually, our hottest day of the summer is occurring here, 34 degrees at uh, Jersey into the 90s Fahrenheit. 33 is uh, reached at Camden, Heathrow and Southampton as well on this day. Beautiful, hot and dry summer's day. It doesn't last long. By the second, we've had a bit of a thundery breakdown as storms are heading in. Uh, from the west and then we get this much cooler push of air from uh, the northwest uh, something like a 20 degree dropping temperature takes place there from uh, the 1st through to the 3rd of July but it doesn't last long because by the 6th we're back into high pressure again and temperatures are rising once more uh, back to uh, 31 degrees 88 uh, Fahrenheit on this day the 6th of July uh, 1952 beautiful spell of summer weather. Move through to the temp and high pressure still dominated, bringing bring lots of dry, fine and warm conditions. Then the high pressure pulls out a little bit into the Atlantic and allows this cooler northwesterly uh, flow with some showers up in the north. But it's not particularly unsettling. In fact, some places don't record any measurable rain at all from the 12th to the 28th of July. So it's a long run of uh, very dry uh, weather through July 1952. It has a CET this month, setting temperature of 16.8 degrees. And this follows on, that's pretty warm, it follows on from uh, quite a warm June and a very warm May, which had a setting temperature of 13.4. So this early part of the summer, no severe weather at all going on, really, just lots of dry and at times pretty warm uh, weather. So we very quickly lose that showery uh, stuff. We build the Azores high back in again on the 20th of July, bringing again lots of dry and fine weather. 25th, lots uh, lovely weather. Again, high pressure extending through the country, bringing uh, bags of dry and uh, fine conditions. But it's not going to last much longer. As we go through to 27th uh, and the 28th, we find the summer beginning to break down. The high pressure's pulling out into the Atlantic. We're starting to get low pressure forming up to the north of the country. And uh, eventually this low pressure takes over the pattern at the end of July and into the start of August. And that's pretty much summer gone uh, then. It breaks early and it doesn't come back. So here we go, we're into our first sort of uh, disastrous uh, period, which is August 1952. The actual Lynmouth disaster occurs on the 15th to the 16th of August, but to set the scene, the first couple of weeks is very wet. So it's not only the rain that falls within that 24-hour period, as important as that was, um, the first two weeks of August preceding the Lynmouth disaster are also uh, very wet and very unsettled. So we've got low pressure here centering over the country on the first day of August 1952, and that continues into the uh, early part of the month. The 7th takes that first area of low pressure away to uh, the east, but another area of low pressure starting to move in uh, from the west. So we're going to a very disturbed period. This is the 9th of August 1952, and low pressure... It's really dominating the weather, bringing lots of heavy rain. Uh, so already the river levels are probably starting to rise up, especially so in the west. And uh, this looks really wet and unsettled. We go to the 12th, still looking very unsettled, very wet at times as well. Quite a humid southwesterly coming in ahead of this low pressure. No doubt producing, uh, giving the energy to produce quite a lot of heavy rain. And into the 13th, yes, we keep it unsettled. And we get to the 14th, and this is really where we're starting to set the scene now. Uh, for what's going to happen because we've got low pressure with cool air out to the northwest and then we've got low pressure forming down to the south and southeast of the country with hot and humid air and that hot and humid air is trying to push northwards out to southern Europe trying to get into uh, the British Isles where we are actually within the cool air. So the disaster begins on the 15th of August with this area of low pressure uh, just here. Uh, that's pushing a weather front northwards, and that weather front uh, has a lot of energy uh, trapped within it. And we get around 24 hours of persistent torrential rain falling on the south and the southwest of the country. I'm going to read you Trevor Harley's description of uh, what happened. So the famous and catastrophic flood of uh, Lynmouth, North Devon, as a result of the rain on North Exmoor on the 15th to the 16th of August 1952. 
after 20, 225 millimetres of rain fell in 22 hours at Longstone Barrow, draining into uh, the West, the West uh, Lynn River. 275 millimetres is estimated to have fallen over parts of Exmoor. I'll say that again. 275 millimetres of rain fell in a 24-hour period, probably slightly less than a 24-hour period, uh, over Exmoor. As the eastern west Lynn rivers reach record levels where they converge near the seafront of uh, Lynmouth Town, we have a depression moving north on the 14th, which you can clearly see uh, just there. The 21 hours of heavy rain starting around noon on the 15th followed heavy rain over pr the preceding two weeks, which uh, we've just discussed. It rained most of the day over most of Devon with a seven hour long intense downpour from late afternoon on the 15th of August through into the early hours of the 16th. The flood came in darkness with a sudden surge of water. There was a loss of 34 lives, 93 buildings were destroyed or severely damaged. 420 people were made homeless, 38 cars were washed into the Bristol Channel and 28 bridges uh, were just swept away through this tremendous flood. The water moved large rocks, trees, telegraph poles and cars um, through the river and down into uh, Lynmouth Town and of course into uh, the Bristol Channel. It's possible that even more rain fell nearby at Simon Bar, possibly up to 300 millimetres uh, fell there. This is one of the most extreme weather events of the 20th uh, century. And as I say, it's all caused by this area of low pressure that we have uh, down to the south of the country with a big contrast in temperature. So there's the cool upper air temperatures that are through the UK, but there's all the heat that we've got down across France that's trying to push up out of uh, southern Europe. It's that temperature contrast that's helping to fuel the energy and provide the energy for this uh, disaster. So this is midnight on the 16th of August when we've got this flood raging uh, through Lynmouth Town after that, uh, after a full day of torrential rain, a seven hour uh, downpour. There's the low pressure that's causing uh, this disaster. It doesn't look all that much, uh, does it? But as I say, and as Trevor Harley has said, this is one of the most severe weather events that occurs during uh, the 20th century. In some ways, it's similar to what happened at Boss Castle in, uh, again, August 2004. But of course, in the, uh, in the situation with Boss Castle, there was no real loss of life. It uh, wasn't uh, as devastating at all as the flood that occurred at uh, Lynmouth. Now, there is a little bit of um, controversy about uh, the Lynmouth uh, disaster. There's a bit of a conspiracy theory. It's believed that in the days preceding this, the RAF uh, were doing uh, cloud seeding experiments down in the south, um, sort of trying to uh, create rain, if you like. And some people believe that the Lynmouth disaster would never have happened if it hadn't have been for these cloud seeding experiments. Actually, uh, Philip Eden has um, pretty much uh, disproved uh, that. Um, there are various reasons why uh, the cloud seeding that the RAF was probably doing around this period various reasons why that wouldn't have contributed uh, to this disaster. One of the main reasons is that actually it had happened before. So in uh, 1607 and also in 1796, there were very similar floods uh, in the Lynmouth area. They didn't cause the kind of uh, devastation that we had in 1952. But even so, very similar floods occurred in 1607 and 1796. And it's sort of very similar as with Boss Castle, where um, you can get uh, the right conditions for these disasters uh, to occur. I actually show you a chart uh, that, uh, or a picture that shows exactly uh, what happened. So I just described what you're looking at here. We've got Exmoor uh, up here. We've got uh, Lynmouth, of course, uh, around here. 
Uh, that's the Bristol Channel uh, just there. And then we've got the two rivers. So we've got the West uh, Lynn River there, uh, which is draining off Exmoor. And also we've got the East uh, Lynn River there. And the two rivers, they're kind of converging around uh, Lima. So we've got this torrential rain that's falling on Exmoor and that rain is pouring into that part of the river. We've got more uh, rain coming off the uh, moors and the uh, hills around here that's draining into the Eastland River and the whole lot is converging uh, around the unfortunate town of uh, Lima. And so that explains essentially what what happened, why there was such disaster. It's the uh, it's a effect of the rain really combining uh, with the terrain that produces the uh, severe flooding that eventually engulfs uh, Lima village. Um, so possible that the uh, seeding might have had some influence, but uh, Philippines has pretty much discounted that over the years. And essentially, it was just. Um, one of those natural severe weather events uh, that do occur from time to time. As I say, it did cause the loss of life. 38, four people uh, were killed in this event, unfortunately. And then there was actually um, three uh, scouts killed, uh, a man from Manchester, uh, also in a separate incident associated with the same flood when uh, the River Bray uh, flooded. I'd say that killed uh, three scouts who were camping close to the River Bray at a, at a place, I think it's called uh, File. Um, so, very devastating spell of weather in uh, August 1952, the uh, Lynmouth disaster. That's our first devastating uh, spell of weather. I believe this... Um, weather event uh, sort of uh, was the impetus to get uh, Sir Michael Fish, the legend that is Sir Michael Fish, to um, take up meteorology. He's always cited uh, the Lynmouth disaster as being one of the main drivers behind his desire to become a uh, meteorologist. Um, and probably uh, find out the causes of this disaster and also improve uh, the warning system. So that's our first disaster in uh, 1952. So we move on to uh, the 17th of August. We take that horrible area of low pressure away, but we remain in an unsettled pattern. Yes, more low pressure is driving through into the 18th of August, 1952. That's tracking up the channel on the 19th, bringing no doubt more very wet to ever into south. Hopefully uh, no more severe flood. Uh, such as what we had at Lynmouth. And then we go through to 21st and the 24th. We finally get a reprieve from the unsettled where we get a little bit of a ridge building in from the Azores High, and that starts to settle things down just a little bit. We run up towards the end of the month, and uh, still an unsettled pattern. Really, this takes us to the final day of August uh, 1952 when low pressure is moving in off the Atlantic, no doubt bringing more wet weather, ending the month, what has been phenomenally and disastrously wet in places, ending the month on quite a wet and unsettled note. And so that takes us into uh, September 1952, the first day of September and the first day of uh, autumn. This is the coldest September uh, on uh, of the 20th century, so it has a central temperature of 10.7 degrees. There is frost and even, can you believe, some snow uh, recorded in September 1952. It's a very unusually cold autumn as well, one of the coldest autumns of the uh, 20th century. So I'll read through the charts of September 1952 uh, quite uh, quickly. And it all really starts with the cool temperatures on the 4th. So uh, we start to bring down this north northwesterly wind here on the 4th of September. That's already beginning to bring much cooler upper air temperatures down from the north uh, with it. High pressure then builds out to west of the country on the 7th. The uh, cool air with, is within that high pressure pushing down uh, from the north. Into the ninth, high pressure is out to the north and west of the country, low pressure to the south and the east, and the winds remain in uh, from the north. At Oxford, this is the uh, coldest September since records began in uh, 1815, can you believe? Very unusual. It's also cold across much of Europe, so uh, we don't suffer 
alone. Um, there's snow across northern and central parts of Scotland uh, through this month, and it does lie, in fact, on uh, high ground. It's particularly frosty through the middle part of the month. Minus uh, three degrees is going to be recorded in East Anglia and the Midlands on the 19th. So let's run further on, and we can see it on the 12th. We've got high pressure out to the northwest. We're bringing in these very cool uh, north, northeasterly or easterly winds, no doubt producing showers in the east, but the main thing is the uh, really uh, low temperatures that we've got coming in. The 7th of September is actually the coldest day of the month, very early on, when temperatures quite widely are uh, underneath 10 degrees Celsius. Let's just go back and have a look at that. This day is the coldest day of the month, where temperatures are under 10 degrees Celsius across the country. Very unusually cold uh, for southern parts of the country. Now, from the middle part of September uh, 1952, we get this area of high pressure building. Looks quite nice, but of course, we've got the legacy of the very cool air that's already established. So this period, we start to get those frosts uh, that I was talking about. We have temperatures going down, as I say, to uh, as well as minus three degrees across uh, some parts of the country through this middle phase of uh, September 1952. There's your rare temperatures for the 18th of September, and you'll see that we are bringing the minus five isotherm into northern parts of Scotland. That's kind of like the minimum requirement for snow. It's very unusual to see that in the month of September. Now, it moderates a little bit on the 21st. It starts to turn a little bit milder and not quite as cold then. And actually, we turn the winds into the west with the final stages of the month. So things do begin to turn a little bit milder right at the end of the month. Still unsettled uh, with bands of rain moving through. A deep area of low pressure is on the east coast of Scotland on the 26th of September, bringing down again another push of very cool air uh, from the north. By the way, this is a uh, repeating pattern. You see, it's very early. In, uh, it's only in September, but it is a repeating pattern that's going to occur, and you'll see it a lot with low pressure to the east of the country, bringing down these northerly winds. It is this kind of pattern is what's responsible for the uh, flooding disaster down the North Sea in January and February of 1953. So already the kind of pattern that we had in the winter is beginning to establish itself uh, in September. That's very, very early and very unusual uh, for that to happen. This is how we end September uh, 1952 with more low pressure heading in from the south, bringing uh, yet more uh, wet weather and it's very cool as well. This first day of October uh, 1952 with low pressure sitting to the south and the southeast, very cool with these northeasterly winds wrapped around this low pressure, probably bringing gales across the country and no doubt copious amounts of uh, heavy rain as well. The Central England temperature for uh, October 1952 comes out at 8.8 .8 degrees. It's a cold and changeable uh, month with some cold and frosty nights, often stormy with heavy showers across uh, many parts of the country. So let's quickly rattle through uh, these charts. This takes us to the 8th of October, 1952. This to the 10th. You see that high pressure is out to the west on the 10th of October, bringing down this cool uh, northerly wind. Once again, that would be producing more heavy showers. Winds regularly in from the north through this autumn. That's the reason it is one of our coldest autumns of the uh, 20th century. This is the 12th of October. We've got a ridge of high pressure across the country and you'll notice it's trying to get up towards Scandinavia as well quite interestingly do have a go at forming a bit of a Scandinavian high there uh, on the uh, 13th of October doesn't really come to much though low pressures driving back in off the Atlantic bringing yet more wet weather this sort's very very wet on the 14th would have been a lot of heavy rain coming in with that and it's cold as well I suspect on the northern edge of this low pressure somewhere like the Pennines there probably would have been some snow. 15th of October looks like that so again high pressure is ridging through the country giving us a slightly quieter into notice the high up over Scandinavia once again actually on the 17th the winds are trying to turn into the east it's uh, trying to take over this Scandinavian high, but this area of low pressure in the Atlantic looks like it's going to have a go at dislodging it. But the wind is in from the east on the 21st of October at uh, 9.52. Not for long, though, because by the 23rd, 
yet another deep area of low pressure is sweeping in from the Atlantic coming against this area of high pressure no doubt bringing a lot of heavy rain notice isobars very tightly packed with this low pressure so it would have been really really stormy and actually on this day the 23rd of October 1952 a tornado hits and causes damage in Londonderry uh, as I say it's very wet um, uh, in uh, the west and it's a little bit drier in the east but uh, it is generally uh, really wet through this uh, period of the latter stages of October uh, 1952 go through to the end of the month and we're dragging up a much warmer southwesterly flow uh, once again and that's how we finish up uh, October 1952 on a very unsettled note once again notice the pattern is that low pressure is in the North Sea to the east and northeast of us we're bringing the air down uh, from the northwest and so that takes us through to November 1952, our final month of the uh, autumn. This is a cold month uh, with a central England temperature of just 4.2 degrees. It's wetter than average, interestingly, in the south and the east, but drier than average in the north and west. The first half of the month is quite cool, but it's really the second half of the month that uh, does become uh, very cold. However, we begin the first day, uh, interestingly, very mild with 17 degrees uh, being recorded uh, in Devon, uh, but it's not going to last all that long. So we move through to uh, the 4th and on to the 5th, and generally it's quite a mild opening to November 1952 with the air coming in from off the Atlantic. It's generally uh, not overly cold. But our first push of cold air happens on the 6th of November. Uh, as this, Again, look at this, it's a repeating pattern that started in September. It's going to carry on to February. Low pressure in the North Sea, the jet stream on a northwest southeast trajectory, low pressure down here, and bringing our first push of colder air down from the north uh, on the 6th of November 1952. This is very reminiscent uh, to the pattern you're going to see that causes the devastating flood down the east coast in January and February. So just keep that in mind that already the seeds were being sowed, if you like, for what's going to happen. The seventh, we actually got a northerly gale blowing here across the country, no doubt bringing uh, wintry showers into the north. Again, it's a pattern of high pressure out to west, low pressure to the east. North jet stream on the northwest southeast jet stream bringing down that strong and cold northwesterly wind, and that continues up to the temp as well. Notice by the temp, we're beginning to get quite a bit of northern blocking starting to appear up to the northern part of the uh, country. Through to the 12th, and it's staying quite cold, really on the cold side of the high pressure, the wind continues to be coming from a northerly direction. I say it's not overly cold at this point, but it's quite chilly, but the coldest phase is actually going to set in in the second half, and it starts with the area of high pressure starting to move up towards this very large area of high pressure that's actually sitting over Russia. That is a Siberian high, it's a true true Siberian high and the high pressure out here that's been sitting two hour west through most of the autumn that is starting to try and link up with the Siberian high quite an unusual pattern especially as early as November it's sort of thing you can see more later in the winter the wind is trying to get in to the east and we're trying to drag in uh, much colder air from the east. We go through to the 15th and uh, it's looking increasingly blocked both to the east and to the west and to the north of the country and inevitably this is going to set up quite a severe spell of weather. By the 16th the trough is starting to uh, sink southwards and we've got the ridge from the Atlantic ridging into the area of high pressure that's sitting over Russia, this true uh, Siberian high. So this is going to set us up for a much colder phase of weather for the second half of November. There's the minus I 5 isotherm across western parts of the country moving uh, out to the west and bringing this cold continental air in from the east. So by the 17th, we are firmly in a cold spell of weather then the wind is coming in from the east and the northeast it's cold enough for snow i suspect this would have been bringing snow showers into uh, eastern parts of the country 
So although we start off mild uh, during November 1952, it does turn colder uh, by the middle part of the month. It begins to get uh, very cold indeed. Now we carry on through into uh, the uh, second half of the month, so we move up to the 18th, and it's staying cold there with high pressure again to the north and the northeast of the country. By the 19th, we're bringing in proper easterly winds here into southern parts of the country. They will be bringing snow showers with them into the east. The north, not much snow there, but just very cold, uh, very dry, and very frosty here on the 19th of November 1952. So after all of that very stormy weather that we had through the earlier part of the month, this storm that I showed you running down the North Sea on the 6th of November, and uh, by the way, that uh, created winds, gusts of wind between 75 and uh, 85 and 97 uh, miles per hour uh, in various parts of the country. So that was pretty devastating uh, from a wind perspective as well on the 6th of November 1952. So after all of that stormy weather through the earlier part of the month, we are now firmly in a calmer but much, much colder spell of weather. And these easy winds would have been producing uh, quite a bit of snow down across the south. Certainly snow showers. There's the upper air temperature showing that it would have been cold enough for snow to have been falling. This is quite an interesting chart on the 20th of November. Low pressure to the south, proper east, northeasterly wind, cold wind as well. Uh, no doubt driving in more snow showers to eastern parts of the country. It's believed that this is probably the snowiest November since uh, that of 1919. I suspect there hasn't been a November since uh, November 19 that has been as snowy as this. Low pressure is centering over the country on the 21st, still within quite cold air. So um, we would have either had cold rain or I, I suspect there would have been snow across some parts of the country. The 22nd takes that low pressure uh, away to the south and we start to open the door to a really cold push of air uh, from the north. That cold air surges southwards on the 23rd of November so that by the 24th we've got a little area of high pressure uh, within some uh, very cold and usually cold air. There's the upper air temperature showing the minus 5 ice firm is clearing the country on the 24th of November 1952 and the minus 10 ice firm very early to be seeing that is into uh, parts of Scotland. In fact, on the 25th of uh, November 1952, this day, under this uh, really cold ridge with an area, a cold pool, an area of cold air sitting over the country on this day, uh, temperatures uh, to Aberdeen uh, we only max out at minus 5 degrees, uh, can you believe? And it happens again at Estelle Muir on the uh, 29th. Um, there was a maximum of just minus 4 degrees as well at Glasgow, I believe, on the 29th of uh, November. So unusually cold conditions, sub-zero uh, temperatures are going on and temperatures going down into minus double digits, minus 12 degrees, for example, in these closing days of November 1952 at uh, Kelda and minus 15 degrees at Darwini. Um, a lot of winters these days never get as cold as that throughout the whole of the winter, so that's a very unusually cold uh, temperatures for so early in the uh, season. Now we move through to the 26th, and not only have we got the cold weather to uh, contain, we've also got lots of heavy snow. This area of low pressure is trying to come in from the Atlantic. We've got a gale force and bitterly cold uh, east southeasterly wind ahead of it, and this is uh, causing a snow event. So there's snowfalls, heavy snowfalls, uh, for four days across parts of the country, uh, leading to 15 centimetres of snow on uh, low ground. And on high ground, we get 30 centimetres of snow in uh, parts of the Midlands from this area of low pressure from the 25th through to the 26th, 27th, 28th of November. This the uh, upper air temperatures for the 26th. Anywhere that's outside of that yellow area, it can snow, and that's particularly through the Midlands and parts of eastern England. By the 27th, the cold air is beginning 
to win the battle. So probably as this area of low pressure moves up through the channel on the 27th, we see the snow that's already falling heavily across the Midlands to parts of Wales and southern parts of England too. This is a classic snow event that we have here in the closing days of November 1952 with this area of low pressure on the northern side. The cold air is winning the battle, squeezing this low pressure uh, out here comes the minus five ice firm surging back. We end November 1952 on a cold note. We're bringing in these easterly winds. They could be bringing more snow into the south and for the north end of this area of high pressure. So there, as we've already explained, very, very cold and usually cold, very frosty nights, daytime temperatures not really rising above uh, freezing. And so that takes us on to the first day of uh, winter 1952-1953 uh, and we're about to move into our next uh, devastating spell of weather which is going to be the great smog of December 1952 but before we get there I think we'll just have a little break so uh, I'm going to hit the pause button uh, I'm going to get a drink of water to uh, moisten my throat and uh, why don't you hit the pause button as well and get yourself a cup of tea and some biscuits and I'll see you back uh, in a few minutes. Okay, and we're back and suitably refreshed, I hope. So we're going to go on into our next disaster, which is the uh, smog of December 1952. So what's happened is that we have this very cold uh, November, of course. There's lots of snow on the ground, got cold air, and now we're going to have an area of high pressure building over the top of that cold air that's going to create an inversion and that inversion is going to produce uh, a lot of fog through the opening days of uh, 1952. Not quite yet, we see the 2nd of December and high pressure still a little bit out west so we've still got a little bit of breeze coming down from the north and the northwest part of the country. Actually turn the wind in, into the north again on the 3rd of December uh, 1952. But then the high pressure starts to collapse down over top of the country. This is really the start of it and it begins uh, with quite an innocuous looking chart. I mean we wouldn't look at that uh, if you have that now and think of anything out of your room. yes, there might be a little bit of fog, there might be uh, widespread frost. Of course, we would ha still have the snow on the ground from the uh, snowy weather in November. But we wouldn't look at that and think of anything out of the ordinary is taking place. But this is a very different time before the Clean Air Act. Actually, the Clean Air Act um, was brought in after this devastating uh, spell of weather. Uh, so we've got mostly um, coal fires. Lots of coal fires are burning away, of course, all day, every day, due to the cold weather that's already been established from November. We've also got huge chimney, industrial chimneys that are bellowing out copious amounts of uh, soot from uh, coal fires as well. And so this high pressure with the cold air and the inversion creates the perfect recipe for fog. And then the smoke and the soot from the chimneys and the fires and the industrial chimneys combines with the fog to produce this devastating spell of weather. Just read you what uh, Trevor Harley has wrote about uh, this uh, December. So this month will always be remembered for one great weather event, the Great London Smog, early in the month, 5th to the 9th in particular. It was primarily London that was affected, although I think many industrial areas um, towns and cities were affected as well, but it's remembered for particularly being uh, severe in uh, London. Trevor says this is one of the most extreme weather events of the century. Of course, following the extreme weather event of Lynmouth, uh, we've got uh, another one. An anti-cyclone, of course, a temperature inversion over London, a combination of fog and air p pollution, particularly from domestic coal fires, uh, led to catastrophic fog. At its most dense, oh wait for this, visibility was reduced to just 10 to 20 yards, uh, in some places even less than, than that. The fog was black and left oily deposits over win windows. Can you imagine that? Your windows covered with kind of like a black tar, and imagine breathing that 
into your lungs. Around 4,000 deaths were attributed, attributed, I should say, to this smog. Though there's now evidence that it might have been as many as 12,000 deaths in these uh, opening days of December 1952 caused by uh, this terrible fog. It leads, as we explained, to the 1956 uh, Clean Air Act. The fog duration of four days, 18 hours is equal uh, record for uh, low altitude, along with another smog that occurred in November 1948. But away from the fog, actually, it was uh, quite sunny uh, in some places. So it's the high pressure combined with um, the cold air and the inversion that's going on in the atmosphere, combined with the uh, chimneys and the coal fires that is causing this uh, terrible weather event. You see, the upper air temperatures are still quite uh, cool. Not as cold as back in November, but still quite cool. So the high pressure sitting there, a little bit to our east, actually, as we go through to the 6th. Again, you wouldn't look at that and think anything particularly severe is going on. But remember, this is a very, very different time before the Clean Air Act, um, which is now responsible for the fact that not only don't we get any smogs, we don't get all that much fog either. And partly that's respond that's caused by the warmer climate that we're living in, uh, but also partly that is caused by the uh, effects of the Clean Air Act. No real relenting from this great smog on the scent. That high pressure is still sitting there, uh, dominating the weather. I assume in sunny areas, this is fairly mild and pleasant period. Probably with frosty nights, but probably pleasantly mild and sunny by day. But under this smog, because it's completely blacking out the sun, I assume it would also have been uh, very, very cold. Can you imagine just breathing in that uh, air full of uh, smoke and uh, tar. It's also almost enough to make me want to start coughing uh, right now. It continues into the 8th. So day after day, this smog goes on in our industrial towns and cities. It's not until the 9th that finally we begin to push in uh, a westerly flow. Still the high pressure is trying to cling on to the south and southeast here on the 9th of December. But by the 10th, look at that. The westerlies have broken through. It's mild across the whole country. And the wind is uh, getting up. You can see that by the isobars tightening. That's blowing away all of that horrendous uh, smog and uh, fog. But as I say, it's done its damage. Uh, 12,000 people potentially have died uh, by this point due to respiratory uh, effects of breathing in that deadly smog and uh, horrible air that was trapped underneath that area of high pressure. So it turns briefly milder here, but then not long before we get another colder push of air. On the 12th, low pressure is moving away to uh, the east. And yes, look at this. We're back to the pattern again, aren't we? We've got high pressure out to the west. We've got low pressure diving down the North Sea. Keep that in mind for when we get to January and February. The wind's going into the north. And this is setting us up into another cold spell. And that looks like a real northerly that's pushing down. Uh, across the country here on the 15th of uh, December uh, 1952. So uh, the Great Smog was followed by a brief mild spell, but then there was uh, heavy snow in the second week, 40 centimetres of snow falling at Welshpool on the 14th, 30 centimetres of snow at uh, West Kirby, Merseyside, here on the 15th from these uh, strong and cold, biting uh, northerly winds, up to 40 centimetres of snow across North Wales. They go through to the 16th and the 17th, um, we get uh, 17 centimetres of snow falling at Birmingham. Uh, so we carry on with these northerly winds as the upper air temperatures show the extent of the cold air surging southwards uh, once again. The 16th, this looks like a snow event moving in from the uh, west. We've got a weather front heading into that cold air, indicated by the kinks in the ice bars. That will be bringing more heavy snow in across the country. Look at that. The low pressure is winding itself up to north of Scotland again. Here comes our next push of gale force. Northwesterly winds again driving in heavy snow. Notice again that low pressure is going on a northwest southeast trajectory. So by the 18th, there it is, sat in the North Sea bringing down this strong to gale force 
uh, northerly wind yet again. That would be bringing not only a surge of cold air southwards with snow, particularly in the north and the east of the country. It would also be bringing uh, very uh, strong winds down the eastern coast. Again, beginning to set up perhaps the uh, possibility of something happening in terms of flooding down the east coast uh, later in the winter. Severe drifting in the north, 450 centimetre drifts at uh, Sky Villages in Orkney and Shetland are cut off with these cold northerly wind and then this is followed by this severe storm uh, where we uh, have a 111 mile an hour wind at uh, Cranwell in uh, Lincolnshire probably a record gust for lowland Britain 91 mile an hour at Stornoway and 90 mile an hour at Fleetwood in uh, Lancashire Buildings were damaged in the Midlands and eastern England uh, with these very strong and cold northerly winds, severe gales pushing down across the country with this area of low pressure through the 17th and into the 18th. Now, this is the same pattern that's going to bring the flooding to the east coast on in January and February of 953. You may ask why this is actually a little bit windier probably uh, than the winds that occur in January and February that you're going to see in a few minutes. So why didn't this one produce flooding down the East Coast? The reason is probably due to uh, high tides. We have higher tides uh, at the end of January and inside of February 1953. So after all that cold snow air through the middle part of the month, then we get another change as the air begins to back into west and the southwest, and this starts to bring a much milder spell for Christmas. So this is Christmas Eve 1952, wet and windy, traditional wet and windy Christmas Eve. That's Christmas Day, also looking pretty wet and windy, as is Boxing Day too. So no particularly severe weather over the Christmas period of 1952, just traditional mild wet and windy weather after Christmas however look what's happening again we've got another build of high pressure out to north and west it's forcing the low pressure with the trough to head south these was winds getting back into the north again bringing another push of colder air down from the north so we go to the end of the year on a cold note that's probably bringing in snow showers particularly across eastern parts of the country on the 29th, the 30th, and to New Year's Eve, staying quite cold, really low pressure, sent to the north of Scotland, bringing either showery rain or maybe even something uh, more wintry than that. There's the upper air temperatures for the New Year's Eve, 1952. Not as cold, but probably still cold enough to be producing something wintry across uh, particularly northern parts of the country. And then we move through into uh, January uh, of uh, 1952. And it looks like I've gone a little bit wrong uh, with the charts here. So I'm going to have to just hit the pause button again and uh, get the charts back in the right order. So uh, I'll see you back in a couple of seconds. OK, and we're back with the charts in the right order. And this is the uh, chart for New Year's Day of uh, 1953. We begin January 1953. We have a century in temperature of 3.3 degrees. On a cold note, we've got uh, the winds in from the north and the northeast again, as so often through this autumn and winter of 52-53. So this is the second of January. High pressure's building across the country and that keeps the cold weather going through to the fourth. The winds in from the northeast, probably bringing snow showers into the southeast. Otherwise, it's mostly dry and frosty as the upper air temperatures looking cold. Um, this looks like a snow event pushing southwards and eastwards on the 6th, and that's uh, heading into that cold air, so uh, probably outbreaks of snow heading south and east, followed by another push of high pressure, and again, that's bringing uh, quite uh, cold and frosty, mostly dry conditions on the 8th. By the night, things are beginning to break down in terms of this cold weather. Milder air is beginning to move back in uh, from the Atlantic. And very gradually, this milder air starts to push through. So by the time we get through... Uh, to the 14th, we uh, find that, uh, again, we've got uh, these west southwesterly winds bringing milder air back into the north, probably still quite frosty at times, you will think, uh, down in the south. But this is now within a much milder air mass through this middle part of January uh, 1953. The alignment is very different, so the ridge is generally centred to our south and the east, which means the air coming around it is from the north and the west has a much milder 
uh, direction, of course. Lots of quiet weather uh, through this period. Uh, as well. It's a very dry uh, month, January 1953, particularly dry uh, over Yorkshire. Trevor Harley says that the first eight days were cold, but then it turned much more mild. It reaches 14.4 degrees at Whitby uh, on the 29th. It snowed in the southeast on the 5th. We saw that, those easy winds, and the snow laid until the 9th. And then it turned mostly mild and uh, quiet. So we run up towards the last stages of the month on a generally mild note. There's a long fetch southwesterly heading in across the country on the 27th. That's producing those uh, mild temperatures, lifting the temperatures up to 14, 15 uh, degrees quite widely across the country through to the final stages of the month. This is how it looks on the 29th of uh, January 1953. Not particularly indicative of anything severe going on, dragging up a very mild southwesterly flow. It does look unsettled to the northern part of the country, but overall, you wouldn't look at that and think a devastating spell of weather is on the way. But how quickly the weather can change, and we go through to the final days of the month, and what happens is that another area of low pressure on the 31st of January 1953 starts to surge southwards, Again, and this takes us to our third disaster of this video. So, this is what Trevor says about this particular spell. The month was, of course, most memorable for the great storm on the 31st of January, continuing into the 1st of February. It led to widespread flooding on the North Sea coast, a depression deepened, there it is, to the north of Scotland, uh, a dip deepened as it to move southwest between Norway and Scotland, a strong north to northwest wind with gusts of 100 miles an hour plus in combination with low pressure, 970 millibars on the afternoon of the 31st, and this is the difference between what happened in December. High spring tides caused a great coastal surge to move uh, down the uh, North Sea. The tide was 2.5 metres above normal at uh, Kings Lynn, for example. The surge uh, ran ahead of the high tide by 90 minutes. 307 people, wait for this, 307 people were drowned and 2,500 square miles of land lay underwater after uh, this period. 307 people who lost their lives, um, and the loss of lives was greater, actually, in the uh, Netherlands, where over 2,000 people uh, died in this great storm uh, disaster. Over one-sixth of the Netherlands lay under uh, water. And earlier in the day, before this storm surge occurred, on the 31st of the 1st, uh, but earlier in the day on the 31st, a British rail car ferry, the Princess Victoria, sank uh, near Belfast, uh, and the lot, there's loss of life there of 132 uh, souls killed in this tremendous storm that occurred at the end of January. So all of this loss of life that we've had from uh, sort of August through uh, December, through to January and February, quite a uh, horrific spell of weather, you have to say, uh, is occurring here through 1952-1953. Very historic indeed. So this is midnight on the uh, 1st of February 1953. The storm's at its worst. The low pressure is sitting over Denmark. There's the northerly wind blasting those 100 mile, 100 mile an hour gusts down the east coast, combining with the high tides to produce this awful flooding that's running down the North Sea and into uh, the Netherlands as well. It's cold air, of course, winds in from the north, so not only is it producing the uh, devastating flooding, that wind is also driving in snow to northern and eastern parts of the country as well. Uh, this disaster uh, had impacts also. The uh, North Sea defences were greatly increased after uh, this disaster. If you've ever been to the East Coast, you'll have seen all of those defences that have um, been uh, built up across uh, low-lying areas. So if you drive, say, along the Norfolk coast, uh, I've uh, driven on the Norfolk coast many times uh, between uh, Cromer and uh, Lower Stoft, and uh, you see those huge defences that are built up. A lot of those were, at the very least, increased after this 
uh, disaster. So again, just as uh, with uh, the smog that occurred in December, this did have effects in terms of uh, government policy. It was a very important turning point, really, in the history of the nation in terms of flood defences. So that horrendous storm is out of the way on the 2nd of February. We're into a cold uh, north northeasterly wind uh, then. And it stays cold, really, through the first half of uh, February uh, 1953. This is what Trevor said. The Great Storm and North Sea coastal flooding continued right at the start of the month. Uh, and then it turns cold and snowy through the middle part of the month, which we will move on to uh, next. So here we go on to the 5th. We've got high pressure out to the west, low pressure in the North Sea. Again, bringing down these strong and cold uh, northerly winds. So it stays cold through the first half of the month and it's turning severely cold here across many parts of northern Europe this is the coldest part of the winter in terms of much of Europe severe cold air digging into Scandinavia in the UK we are cold but the severest of the weather is out to uh, the east however by the 7th the winds turning into the east starting to bring that very cold air out of the continent so after the flood comes the freeze we bring the minus 10 isotherm in across the country the minus 15 isotherm is heading into the north sea there would be snow uh, starting to come in uh, with that this looks a very cold chart um I think it's very slack so we would have been seeing severe frost there's not very not very much information uh, from Trevor Harley uh, for this particular period, but I assume it does look very cold, and you would think there would be severe frost here. Look at those upper air temperatures, really severely cold air just over the other side of the North Sea. But the UK is cold enough, I think, for uh, daytime temperature to probably be staying below freezing all day with severe night frost. Then it looks like we have a snow event moving in from the Atlantic into that very cold air on the night. That's no doubt bringing lots of heavy snow uh, across the country as the milder air hits the colder air there would be a proper uh, battle going on uh, there. 3 to the 10th and the 11th we have low pressure heading down into the North Sea again. How often have we seen that since September with these charts? Low pressure in the North Sea bringing in this strong and cold gale force easterly wind that would be driving in uh, more snow into the east. Uh, Trevor Harley says that it was cold and snowy around the 13th, 14th and uh, 15th and uh, well you can see the reason why the wind's in from the east and the northeast and yes that would have been dragging in snow showers if not longer spells of snow into many eastern parts of the country. High pressure begins to start moderating things by the 14th, by Valentine's Day. Things are calming down but still cold uh, no doubt with plenty of hard frost. The cold weather can continues to the 15th but by the 18th the high pressure is beginning to collapse southwards it's starting to turn uh, the wind into the west milder air is beginning to move in and actually the second half of uh, February 1953 comes away with some very mild temperatures so um, for example the 20th 22nd 26th 27th 28th uh, sees temperatures going up to uh, 15 16 degrees quite widely across the country as we end this extraordinarily uh, rough spell of weather and severe spell of weather that starts Started with the Lima flood in August, we end it very benign, very tranquil, and early spring with this area of high pressure setting in in the final days of February 1953. And that brings to a close the historic weather video. So I hope you enjoyed this look at these disasters. We have to keep in mind that um, we do these historic weather videos primarily for entertainment to give something to do on your bank holiday money. But you do have to keep in mind all of the people that lost their lives uh, during this period. We have to respect that. It was a very extreme period of weather from 1952 into 1953 of these various disasters after disasters um, producing uh, conditions that were enough, unfortunately, to kill potentially quite a few thousand people. Uh, so we're going to finish up by having a look at some pictures. Uh, first picture you look at just here is from the Lima flood and my good friend 
Uh, Mark Kinnish sent this one through to me uh, via email. This is uh, the Lynn Muff, uh, or one of the pictures of the Lynn Muff flood. You can see basically looking like a complete uh, disaster. A uh, big thank you to Mark for sending that through. The rest of the pictures that you see have been uh, posted by my good friend David R. And David posted in the comment box uh, to Gaz with it. So again, this is the Lynn Muff uh, flood or the effects of the Lima flood. Again, it looks like a complete total disaster. Another one from uh, Lima. Notice uh, the river there uh, raging through Lima village. Tremendous uh, flood taking place. I think it looks like houses have been partly demolished there uh, on the uh, riverbank. This is from November uh, 1952. This is a car looking like it's stuck in a snow drift. More snow uh, pictures from December uh, 1952 as well. Not sure if that happened before the smog or after the smog, but uh, there we go. A bit deep snow. Uh, in December uh, 1952. This is from the Netherlands after that flood that uh, hit uh, not just the east coast of the UK, but also the Netherlands. And actually, the Netherlands was even worse affected than us uh, from, from uh, January to February 1953. That, that looks really very devastating indeed. This is Canby Island uh, after the flood in uh, February 1953. And finally, this is Great Yarmouth again after the flood sometime around the 1st of February uh, 1953. I wonder what those people were making of it all, uh, trying to find some dry land in that boat. I always love looking at these old pictures and looking at those faces and wondering what they were thinking, what they were feeling after going through such a catastrophic period of weather. Not just their own catastrophe, but all of the catastrophes that had occurred since the Lynmouth disaster. We shall never know. OK, that's it for today's historic video. We've hit one hour. I think this is one of the longest we've ever done, but obviously we've had a huge amount uh, to discuss um, hope you found it interesting and informative. Enjoy the rest of your bank holiday money. This will be placed um, within the historic uh, section at Gaswell Vids. Uh, and uh, yes, it'll have its own page. So you can come back, look at this whenever you want. If you want to watch it all in one go, you're certainly able to come back whenever you want and have a look. But at nearly one hour and one minute, all that remains to be to say, enjoy the rest of your bank holiday money. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.